cryptocurrencies and blockchains amendment to the information technology and she is a regular feature uh, writer in large number of national and international uh, papers as well she has addressed sessions the ease with which she explains the issues itself is a treat not only for the eyes because they say a good good orator or good communicator the, the body language itself speaks the volume of knowledge though hearing a speaker on a virtual platform is entirely different than what we see in a normal course and be that as it may uh, i can show i have at least heard her she has an immense knowledge and the vice chancellor mrs vinay kapoor mehra has teaching experience of 25 years along with the research and because of her immense knowledge she had been earlier the professor and head of the law department guru nanak dev university which is a <clears throat> university not only known in punjab but pan india and abroad their students of law and other departments have created their own name and niche within uh, worldwide she has an acumen to do research on women in law and family law and human rights and her students are doing exceptionally well and fortuitously enough i also know large number of students who, who are practicing in the high court of punjab haryana and they speak volume and what we say they all go gaga the way in she expresses and teaches i on behalf of beyond law clc i would ask uh, professor mrs vinay kapoor mehra to formally welcome the keynote speaker uh, ns napinai and justice kuldeep singh uh, over to you uh, the vice chancellor mrs mehra uh, and thank thank you for making us the knowledge partners for the university which is an esteemed and a prestigious university yes ma'am thank you mr vikas i am really grateful to you for uh, being uh, our knowledge partner for this event so it is a great pleasure to have all these signatories with us today and i hope our students will be benefited from the lecture of uh, ms ns uh, nepinai i have Uh, gone through her bio data on the google and i found her she is the perfect person on this topic and since during this covid period most of us who are never used to have this access to the net and other sources and we are using it and it has become our compulsion our students though they were earlier using it but they don't know the side effects of too much dependence on the on the internet and other uh, e resources we have the loss but since our students are still in their first year so i had a wish that they must know the law so that they should not misuse the technology and they should not be they are not being misused by others so they should have the perfect idea of the cyber laws so that's why so initially we had so many topics in the mind from from where we should start but when we deliberated upon those ideas so uh, finally mr vikas and we uh, came to the conclusion that for the first year student this can be the best option so i am really thankful to beyond law clc for joining us in this venture and i welcome all you on this platform especially today's keynote speaker ms ns nepina uh thank you so much now uh, over to vikas Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. And uh, I would request uh, Ma'am Napinai to give the insights as what 
uh, Professor Vinay Kapoor Mehra has expressed, yes, cyber crime is on the rise and we do not realize the nitty gritties of the same. So we had, as ma'am had said that we had deliberated on what topics should be done, being the students primarily in the teenage and the vulnerability towards the cyber crime and what harms and profits can be there. Uh, over to you, uh, ma'am Napinai. Thank you all so much for having me here. Um, so uh, before I start, may I request that everybody may uh, mute your um, uh, uh, system so that there is no disturbance in the middle and nobody writes on the screen because these are uh, slides which are uh, copyright protected and also it causes uh, an uh, interruption to the flow if somebody uh, writes on it and all that, it actually becomes visible on the screen. So with these uh, general uh, messages, I'd like to jump right in to the main issue. So as ma'am and uh, Mr. Chatrat rightly pointed out, when we were trying to decide on what is the topic we would like to um, um, uh, address today. We decided primarily on uh, this concept of cyber safety and building that into the cyber crime spectrum. And it fitted in perfectly with what I'm doing and what I had in mind when I launched Cyber Sati. The whole construct of Cyber Sati was one, to empower through knowledge, to disseminate knowledge of cyber laws, not just cyber crimes, but with special focus on cyber crimes, so that everybody becomes aware of what are the threats and vulnerabilities that go with this domain. And therefore, once you know, you can protect yourself better. The second uh, vision or the uh, objective of uh, Cyber Sati was to also create peer mentors. So the whole idea is that you particularly the, you know, I meant, I uh, heard ma'am say that most of you here are uh, first year students from the college, though I also see a lot of very senior colleagues on uh, the screen. But for you youngsters out there, you are all what Prensky calls as digital natives. And we, the older generation, as digital immigrants, because you were born to this domain. Whereas we have migrated to this domain. So we are still more cautious. We are careful about uh, how we would uh, deal with this domain. And what is it that, um, you know, what, I mean, our approach itself is still more of caution. Whereas you don't fear the domain. You are willing to use the domain and unfortunately, sometimes it can result in abuse also. And it can also result in you falling victim more easily. You don't fear the domain and you also therefore do not exercise as much caution as we would. We are over cautious sometimes. And I can tell you, the older generation falls prey to crime as much as the youngsters do, if not more. So don't think that I'm saying we don't fall victim to crime because of this. I'm just saying that despite our uh, caution, we fall victim to crime. But the whole concept of peer mentorship was that if you as a youngster fall prey, the first person you reach out to will not be parents, will not be an authority figure like a professor or a teacher, and definitely not the police or courts. Your first thought is to reach out to your friend. And when you reach out that way, the whole thought of Cyber Sati was, that friend you reach out to should also be knowledgeable enough to guide you as like first aid for cybercrime, as I call it, and to guide you to the correct authority figure, whether it's a parent, whether it's a teacher or the police, etc. And that takes me to the next step, which is that you should therefore know what are the remedies that are available in law and how do you approach those remedies? What are the procedures to be followed? So broadly in today's session, this is what I would be uh, covering. May I request, yes, I now have screen share uh, 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 facility. Unfortunately, I was just trying to get that till now. I got it now. So here is my uh, presentation. I will presentation and just addressing you all, but uh, feel free to ask questions. 
and where possible i have already shared the citations etc of the cases that or case laws that i'm relying on when i first started in cyber crimes it was not a situation where we uh, had a lot of precedents or case laws from courts to guide our steps it was also not a situation because i was one of the early players who actually got into cyber laws before india even got its cyber law in the form of its information technology act so in today's session if i say it act i'm only referring to the information technology act and not to the income tax act so when we you know that when we got this law in 2000 it is we were already late in jumping the bandwagon of codifying laws for cyber but the benefit we got because of that was that we could use a lot of precedents in terms of laws and more importantly model laws from other jurisdictions and from ancestral the model laws of course from ancestral so in adapting this when you go through the what we are going to discuss today because uh, you know for the benefit of my brethren out there i assure you that it's not going to be really general inputs we will be delving pretty deep into law also during the session so when we are delving into law i will where possible touch upon the etymology also of provisions and where they come from and why we have what we have today of course there are a lot of mysteries in the it act for instance in 2000 hacking really speaking was not an offense so if you immediately google and look at the 2000 act you will find that section 66 has the heading hacking and you may wonder what is she talking about the difference is hacking as we understand it in general terms is gaining unauthorized access without the consent of the owner of a computer system or the administrator whereas what was set out as hacking in section 66 of the 2000 it act was deleting destroying or altering any data or causing it to be done or causing damage or affecting uh, the uh, you know affecting uh, information or data injuriously or causing loss so it was one of those very convoluted and complicated provisions which had literally nothing to do with our understanding of the act of hacking a mere heading does not decide what is the offense headings are not relevant when we interpret the law it is only meant to be a guiding principle what is the provision that is set out is what dictates it and given the parameters of the offense that was actually covered under 66 i say that hacking was not really an offense under the it act of 2000 virus attacks by 2000 the world had already seen that one of the most vicious cyber crimes which can cause several million dollars worth of loss is a virus attack and yet all these kind of trending offenses as i call them at that point of time like hacking and virus attacks and data theft denial of service attacks all of these were listed as civil penalties in the 2000 act it was only in 2008 december when the amendments to the it act were brought in that these provisions were reviewed and 66 was deleted the old 66 and a new 66 was introduced which said that any offense under section any violation under section 43 which is done with dishonest or fraudulent intent will amount to an offense punishable offense now you may wonder what happened to the convoluted provision which was earlier there in 66 so in the time between 2000 and 2008 when people uh, protested about the draconian aspects of the existing 66 all of us had submitted reports two rounds of public consultations were also held in 2005 and 2006 and the whole trend appeared to be that this provision will be deleted from the legislation 
However, what actually happened was this plus a confusing uh, adaptation of section 65 were transmuted into section 43. So two new subsections were added under section 43 and all the provision subsections under 43, including these two new ones, which are primarily the old section 66 and a modified version of section 65 were added and made an offense by reverse uh, referencing it to section 66. All of this will become important when I walk you through some of the cases. Now, today, this is the roadmap I'm laying out for you. And that's why I've given you the etymology with respect to the law also. And before we move further, I want to just um, uh, red flag one important thing. I do not know if you believe whether the IT Act is the be all and end all of cyber laws. If you believe that it is definitely the only law you have to look at with respect to cyber crimes, let me clarify right up front. I call it the cyber law jigsaw in my book, Technology Laws Decoded. The whole reason for the word jigsaw, which I've used is because it's actually like a puzzle, cyber law puzzle. And the pieces of the jigsaw are actually in different enactments. So even with respect to cyber crimes, and if you even look at the 2000 Act, what you'll find is that amendments were made to IPC. So when you are dealing with cyber crimes, remember that IT Act is not the be all and end all for you to look at before you decide what is the offense that is committed. You need to go back to basics Look at IPC because IPC will give you a lot more clarity and direction on what is the kind of offense that has been committed. If you're going to look only at IT Act, it's myopic and wrong. You know, so please look beyond the IT Act for any topic, any field of cyber law, and particularly for cybercrime. Because these laws are actually scattered everywhere. We have to bring it together and that is exactly what I tried to do with my book, Technology Laws Decoded. And I tried to give a holistic picture in terms of not just each provision, but also the whole evolution of this domain of cyber. The second uh, red flagging I would like to do before we jump forward is so unfortunately, and I've seen this from, you know, I've been teaching uh, and training police from 2003 and judiciary, I think from about 2004 in cyber law. And the one thing I have noticed is the minute you add a prefix, let it be of cyber or of electronic, you automatically assume that somehow it is very complicated, it's different, and you do not know about this domain. It may seem a little um, self-destructive when I tell you the first rule when you approach cyber laws, please forget the prefix cyber. And remember that first principles apply equally. Merely because a prefix of cyber is added, it doesn't change anything. All that it changes is it, uh, it uh, highlights to you a new domain through which you have immense opportunity and with each opportunity also comes immense opportunity for crime, immense opportunity for abuse, immense opportunity for change. So these changes are what distinguish this field of practice and understanding the domain with an understanding, a deep understanding of law is what is needed. Unfortunately, I notice in many instances, the minute cyber is used, everybody thinks IT Act, everyone thinks, oh, this is just complicated and just knowing a little bit of here and there is enough. It is not. A deep dive into law is very important. So with these um, red flags, we will move ahead. What is it that changed the way we lived? You know, I have called this the cyber Pangea in uh, my book. And I talk about how the, and I also refer to it as the reversal of the continental drift. For those of you who may be fans of Ice Age, 
it can be actually visually evocative so what the continental drift did in removing you know in moving continents away from one another cyber actually reversed it has brought us all back together and that's how it creates this whole um, uh, facilitation in terms of communication today during covid we could not have survived if it had not been for this connectivity that we have that links us to the world otherwise we would have just been leading a world of isolation with no access to knowledge or information with this reach of technology naturally the criminals reach also is much wider and therefore the vulnerabilities also increase for the criminal justice system these are the concerns or problems that it faces the very first problem that it faces is the issue of territoriality now when we talk about territoriality why is it a concern firstly the world of cyber is seamless it has no territorial boundaries but our laws are all limited in terms of our territories so this is where ancestral model laws came in handy where they tried to harmonize laws across multiple jurisdictions to ensure that we would not have a problem in terms of being able to enforce municipal laws i'm just going to pause here and give you one illustrative uh, case now this is also a case which i love to uh, share uh, in terms of ingenuity that can also work sometimes you know so in 2000 and this was actually a pre 2000 um, offense and uh, laws were still evolving across the world with respect to cyber uh, the us faced one of its largest virus attacks which caused many a computer to crash many businesses to lose several million dollars and in those days it was also a lot easier to track and trace the criminal down very very quickly they were able to track this violation to one individual ivanov in russia so they are immediately uh, kick started what i call the diadic which is like you know you have the mlat mutual legal assistance treaties you have extradition laws and all that which is what comes into play when you have to uh, enforce uh, across borders so they wrote to russia for seeking extradition of ivanov russia refused and why did they refuse it's not because of the cold war or something that was long over russia refused because the offense that ivanov had committed was not an offense in russia so they said that we should write somebody to criminal prosecution for something which is not an offense in the jurisdiction where he committed the act and therefore they refused extradition the second part of the story gets interesting because uh, us just used ingenuity where its extradition law failed so they gave it a pause and then you know ivanov suddenly gets an invite to visit um, the us to give some session or whatever and he happily accepts because he thinks oh a free ride to this paradise on earth so let me go and enjoy myself beware when you accept invitations right <laughs> so uh, because if i asked you a lot of questions pardon me but blame it on the ivanov case so here ivanov comes straightsing over to the us thinking that he has got this lovely invite etc and the minute he lands on us soil like that he is arrested because then us did not have to worry about russia or its extradition laws but we can't always rely on ingenuity to enforce we need harmonizing of laws we need international laws to help in enforcing against cyber crime some of the instances i will be sharing going forward will show you how a lot of these cases are based not just in a couple of jurisdictions the larger the cyber crime the more the cyber footprint so there are cases which involve about 30000 plus computers in some instances in some of the recent iot uh, enabled crimes the uh, cyber footprint was in millions and in across 
27 to 30 plus countries, if not more. So when we are talking about crimes of that magnitude, we certainly need enforcement to also work very differently and to uphold the first principles of a criminal justice system, which is to act as a deterrent first. So we have to show that our laws actually work. And this is where I see a lot of problems happening. We are not able to show the effectiveness of laws in the field of cyber. We are only showing fear. And that's something I wish and hope will change. The second is we need protective measures. So when law is clear and precise, that acts as a protective measure because we understand that this is what we are protected against. This is my right. This is my remedy in law. And I will then exercise that right. If I don't know what the law is saying, then one, as ma'am rightly pointed out in the beginning, we are going to firstly end up committing a violation. We may actually commit, commit a crime without realizing we are committing a crime because the law is very, it's, not, it's opaque, it's not clear. Two, we do not know what we should protect against. And three, we do not know how the law protects us. So every aspect of law of being a deterrent, of being a preventive and protective measure rather than punitive. And the last leg, even when we take recourse to uh, prosecutions or punishments, how effective is the law? If it works, then it works wonderfully well. If it doesn't, then it actually makes us lose faith in the system. So these are the four fundamental principles which I believe in, in terms of tackling cyber crimes. So let's move forward to what exactly are cyber crimes and how do we deal with it? Now, when you look at the COVID phase itself, these are the evolving trends of crimes that are happening. I will be giving you some specific instances also. And you already know some of them, like the boys' locker room case, etc. But when we first, you know, as I said, first principles, right? So when we say cyber crime, is there a definition? Not really, because we didn't have a definition for crime. So why should we have a definition for cyber crime, right? So there is no harm merely because there is no definition. Broadly, you can take a guiding note as cybercrime deals with offenses which are committed using computers or computing systems or devices as a weapon or where the computers or computing uh, networks or systems or devices are the victim. So when you look at a very broad guiding guideline, then you will understand how to deal with this concept of cybercrime. And let's just look at some of the crimes that are trending and how do we deal with these kind of situations. So I have put boys locker room first because we are also primarily focusing on the young students. And it's very important to understand what the law actually says as an offense. Merely because you are sharing certain information in a closed locker room, does it make it not an offense? Now, I'm going to rely on one of the earliest cases that came up in about 2010 or earlier, probably. This is the Air India Bal Bharti case. Now, a young kid who is a, a, you know, a school student, so must be a young teenager, just into his teens, probably, and who was actually, unfortunately, a victim of physical bullying. So his classmates, and he had probably broken out in acne or suffered some kind of a skin ailment, which had caused pot marks on his face, and they were ragging him, saying porky, etc. We do not know what was running through the boy's mind, but this is what he did. And I'm talking about this because in all the decades of India having its cyber laws also, unfortunately, the kind of crimes that are being committed are not really changing much. And why is this so? Probably because there is not enough. Now this boy 
goes into his Facebook account and he takes photographs of his classmates, girls, and also of his teachers, lady teachers. It's not clear why he would want to do this against teachers. Probably he thought that they didn't protect him or whatever. So he takes these and morphs them with pictures, you know, which are suggestive, nude, etc., and then creates an intranet and shares it. Now, when this case comes up before the juvenile justice board, the you know the issue that was before the board was about granting uh, bail to the child, and I'm all for granting bail to children because we don't want a nation full of criminals, and that's precisely why I'm focusing on this first. Now, the judge of the juvenile justice court notes in the order that you know it is known that boys do graffiti on bathroom walls. So this is something akin to that graffiti on bathroom walls. So we should not really punish a child for what he has done. And they grant him bail. But here is the problem. What you draw on the bathroom wall remains within four walls. It doesn't go beyond that. Whereas what you put on the internet is literally irreversible because, you know, you can put it out there, you can take it off in one hour, one minute, or uh, 36 hours as is given to intermediaries, but you cannot erase it. Once the digital footprint is created, it's there for good. Because somewhere, somebody may have downloaded and will have access to this content you have shared. So what you do online causes very, very grave harm to the victim. And it may not necessarily be a boys versus girls issue here because men or boys can be as much a victim of offenses online as women or girls. The issue here is that gender does create a vulnerability which is more than for boys. And I use the word gender here instead of girls consciously because other genders but other genders are much more vulnerable than even women or girls. I mean, I thought women or girls had the worst possible situation they could face. And here is a situation which it can get worse for others. Imagine their plight, right? Already they're still tackling gender biases. They're still tackling uh, disparities. And here comes, which also helps to bully and stalk and cause very serious harm to them. So when we talk about problems online and talking about people ending up as criminals without realizing, here is my first takeaway for you. Cyberbullying is an offense. The reason why many may believe it is not an offense is twofold and which is why I started with this in the introduction. Merely because you don't have a provision with, say, cyberbullying does not mean that there is no remedy. The second reason why people unfortunately get misled into thinking there is no remedy is because of the strike down of one provision in the IT Act, Section 66A. So when the, when the Supreme Court was faced with this situation, in Shreya Singhal versus Union of India, they were really looking at a situation of abuse or misuse of the provision in politically uh, motivated cases. The case, in fact, uh, the PIL was filed against one of these prosecutions which were initiated in uh, Mumbai, uh, where I'm speaking to you from currently. Uh, as uh, Vikas already pointed out, otherwise I'm predominantly in Delhi and before the Supreme Court, but during COVID, I'm here in Mumbai. So when this case came up, the only thing that was before the Supreme Court was one, which is a given that the section was very open-ended. So it talked about dissemination of offensive content, etc. It was so open-ended that it was left to the discretion of the police and courts to decide whether that is an offense or not, a particular act is an offense or not, and that cannot be how law can function. But the second thing and the more important overriding issue that was before the Supreme Court was the abuse. And naturally, it was struck down. Now, the problem that happened with that was 
many a case of cyber bullying and cyber stalking and trolling, the colloquial term for cyber bullying, all of these cases also suffer. One case which I usually refer to is this case of Chinmayi, who's a singer from South Chennai. I originally from, I'm from the uh, Madras bar, but I, I don't practice there uh, unless somebody briefs me actually. <laughs> In that sense, I practice all over India. So because I'm not here, still from the Chennai bar, I'm originally from there. Since 2000, I've been but anyway, here is a case from my hometown, Chennai, original hometown, where Chinmayi was uh, trolled for, you know, every time somebody uh, takes a specific position in terms of a political issue or maybe a legal issue or uh, something which is very sensitive, you will find that they've immediately become victims of trolling. So it's not like women get trolled more than men. But the kind of trolling that happens against women is more scary. So the standard thing that I have seen from 2000 till date, and probably this was the issue earlier also, but we have, and if you look at the whole thing, you know, the, the evolution, we all started with just no technology or very minimalistic technology. Then we had 1G, we could talk right? And then exchange SMSs. Then it moved to 2G. We are now at 4G and we are thinking about 5G, though I can tell you all you youngsters, the bad news is you're going to have to wait a long time before 5G comes to us. But what was the change that all these Gs brought about? It changed our access to the online domain. It changed the speed with which we could access. And for India particularly, it changed the cost of that connect. When I first connected with the technology, when I got my first mobile phone, it was very expensive. I'm talking about uh, 19, I think it was about 98 or so, you know, and uh, we got our first computer in 1995. I got my first computer rather 1995. So when we are talking about those days, it was very slow internet connectivity. We would be lucky if we even connected for five minutes, etc. Today, you're always connected. So these are the things that changed in just the last couple of decades. And with these changes, you would expect people to also evolve. And this is unfortunately the evolution that is happening, which is that the trolls remain the same, their modus remains the same, their attitudes remain the same. So from 2004 or so, when this case happened, when an activist was giving a session, a live session like this, and people could put questions or queries on chat boxes. Here is a person who's actually signing in with the handle hashtag rapist. That should have given the platform a hint already and blocked him. Unfortunately, they don't. And then he comes onto the call and then starts abusing the speaker and not just general abuse. It's very scary abuse where he talks about rape and gang rape against her and then videographing it and uploading it online, etc. Now, when you look at that to 2020 moving forward and not just the boys versus girls case, I'll share with you so many other similar cases that unfortunately uh, are doing the rounds. You will see that this kind of trolling continues. And, you know, it's very unfortunate because I quite honestly do not believe that many of the trolls realize what is the impact of their action. And that's what I want to focus on in this particular slide. Now, this is a case that happened when this academic session started on 1st June 2020. In preparation for that, a lot of teachers were asked to video record their classes. And these were then not uh, uh, sent out to the students. Now, a young uh, teacher in a blue sari also has recorded her class and she shared, this is shared and what happens immediately after that, she's trolled online. And all kinds of comments from personal comments to sexist comments and sexual innuendo. Now, on one hand is the issue of, is this an offense merely because section 66A was struck down? And two, what is the impact that it has on the victim? What did these students who thought it was very funny, 
What did they achieve? And here is where the problem is. I'm going to address the last first and then move to the criminal part of it. What they achieved was effectively, they have taken away opportunity from lady teachers, which educational institution will want a stigma of their students facing criminal prosecution. So they will play it safe and you will then get male teachers. You can also troll the male teacher. Why is it different when it is a trolling of a woman? They just make for softer targets. Most of the time when you look at the kind of bullying or trolling that a man faces, it would be to affect his position, standing, his intelligence, intellect. Most of the trolling that are done of women affect their sexual uh, gender. So it's always about sexual innuendo and offenses against them in person. And this is why it makes them softer targets. So when we talked about a boy's case, boys was a boy's uh, locker room case, or this blue sari teacher case, what we are really seeing is through your acts, which you think are just pranks, or maybe what you think are just innocuous statements or just something said in fun, one, believe me, you can land in trouble. You may read my uh, article on the boys' locker room case, which is on shethepeople.tv, uh, um, where I have talked about all the specific sections that can be applied to that specific case. Now, uh, the whole uh, excuse that is being given about how a girl was added in by mistake and she was checking out this boy's character and therefore it doesn't amount to an offense may not really hold water. Why? Because the boy who is talking about joining in on a gang rape or videographing it, etc., or any of the other very obnoxious statements did not know who the other person was. It may be said that, you know, in, I already told you that the offenses of hacking uh, you know, denial of service attacks, virus attacks, data theft, etc., were transmuted where dishonest or fraudulent intent were the very basis for treating all these acts as a criminal offense. But when we look beyond this to 66E and 67, now 67 first, 67 of the IT Act deals with publishing or uh, 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 disseminating ob obscene content. So if you're going to be publishing or transmitting obscene content on a digital domain, it doesn't matter whether it's WhatsApp or online, on Twitter, Facebook, what you will. It also doesn't matter if you created a fake ID to share these content. You will still be held liable because anyone can be tracked. It's just that a timely complaint helps. So my first message to all of you, if you, are, if you fall victim, is please invoke your rights immediately because the trails can go cold, but the trails are definitely there. So you may think WhatsApp is encrypted. So sharing some content and then deleting it will take care of it. It doesn't. It can still be retrieved and it can be used Please do not think that I'm just saying all this to scare you. I'm just sharing very factually the reality. And this is a reality by I'm sharing with you because one, you need to be careful what you say. And I always use this example when I'm giving these sessions. If I were giving this session to you in person, would you make those comments that were made either to that activist who was speaking online or to this blue sari teacher, would you say things with sexual innuendo in front of me? If you would not dare do this in front of me, why would you do it online? Why would you do it in a, um, a group where you know others are also accessing it? It's not like something you're just chatting with your friend when you're sitting on the uh, school wall or something, right? So why would you do it? Because you assume that what you're doing within closed doors is um, safe. 
you may also assume that if you put something online with a the typical classic uh, fake id is anonymous merely because you think you are anonymous merely because you think you have a name called anonymous you think you can't be tracked and you troll people online it can be tracked and that person can be made liable but the issue here is not just about tracking you the issue here is why do you do it so to address this before i go also to a few specific provisions here sula calls it the disinhibition theory i have called it in my book the disassociation theory what sula says is that women children everybody in general the minute you go online you drop your inhibition you know you may be this person who won't talk one word to people in person you may not be a, the most social person in physical form but the minute you go online you somehow convert into a very different kind of person and you become more talkative you want to share everything so you know look at the kind of posts people put on social media you would not tell even your own parent what you are going to do today where you been what you have eaten etc but all that the parent has to do is go to your social media site and they will get all that information the same with parents also a parent would you know if they were with their child and an absolute stranger walks up to the child and asks the child for its name the first question the parent will ask is why should you know why are you asking whereas the same parent when they go on social media want to share anything and everything about their child and with absolute strangers with no fear of what can be done with that kind of information so this is sulas disinhibition theory where he says that your natural restriction or restraint that you exercise in your physical form you somehow tend to stop doing that in the online uh, domain or the digital domain he also then goes on to talk about toxic disinhibition and that is the reverse uh, step which is of the criminals just like how we users drop our inhibition and talk more freely online the um, uh, the criminal also has locked uh, dropped his inhibition because he thinks he cannot be found or he thinks he is somehow invisible behind his digital screen and he thinks he can do or say whatever he wants therefore so that's the reason why people think they can say what they want online or do online which they wouldn't dare to do in physical form and this is where therefore it becomes very important for us to have an understanding of how law can be fly implemented and taken recourse to to ensure that the criminal knows that is toxic disinhibition as sula call it or disassociation i called it the disassociation theory more in line with you know macbeth and how um, you know lady macbeth talks about uh, blood on her hands and i've kind of reversed that situation because lady macbeth was not there when the murder she instigated was committed and yet she could see blood in her hands so i have talked about it in that uh, aspect to say that a lot of these people do not realize the blood flow that uh, they can cause through their online uh, actions and therefore they commit these crimes and so like lady macbeth who was also not present at the scene of crime they should actually see that it is blood on their hands they cannot shy away from the fact that it was their action or their criminal act which has caused this blood flow and i'll explain why i'm talking about it as a blood flow in uh, terms of a few specific cases also i may have to pick up a little bit of pace from here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to these are all instances to show how offenses and perversity are on the rise as we are moving forward in terms of particularly offenses against children it is so scary during covid time and within the very first month what is the cyber crime that saw the maximum increase it was searches for child sexual abuse so 67a talks about dissemination of sexually explicit content and this was why i told you that even just sharing nude pictures or videos with somebody can land you in trouble if it is within the parameters of 67 or 67a but 67b was one of the most important provisions that the 2008 act introduced 
and that dealt with child pornographic content. India has one of the strongest in the world of laws which show zero tolerance towards child sexual abuse. And yet, this is the situation we see in India, an increase in child sexual abuse content being groused. And therefore, I would like to just highlight this to show how powerful the law is. Even browsing for child sexual abuse content is a criminal act in India. When you read 67B, along with the POXO provisions, you get a very, very powerful weapon in your hand, which I would strongly request all of you all to wield. If ever you come across content like this, I will tell you all how to file your complaints also, including anonymously if you do not want to be part of the process. So these are just some of the trending crimes. Let me come to this case, which has, caused, which has actually very quietly created a lot of change in law and in social media and in the way they function. Now, 2015, this is a Somoto case, which the Chief Justice took on record when Prajwala, uh, an organization based out of Hyderabad, forwarded two videos of gang rapes that had been uploaded online and with a letter saying how despite the victim writing to, and this is on regular social media, this is not in the dark net, it is not in some dark alley which you don't otherwise go to. This is on regular social media which all of us and our children frequent. So what happened was that the victims came across their own rape videos online they wrote to the sites and it was not uh, taken off. Then they approached Prajwala and Prajwala wrote and then also it was not taken down. So finally this letter was sent and the letter was treated as a complaint and so motor action was taken. Subsequently Prajwala pleaded itself in the matter so we colloquially refer to it as Prajwala versus Union of India. But otherwise Prajwala letter dated 18 to 2015 etc etc is the uh, citation. Now, in this case, initially, the court, uh, Supreme Court uh, focused on uploading of rape and gang rape videos online. Thereafter, it moved to the issues of child sexual content also being uploaded online. I was appointed as an amicus in 2017 February, and I had suggested as a first uh, uh, submission to court the use of artificial intelligence to see how we can block uploading itself of content like this. Now, I had come across this case actually in 2015 when I was writing my book. And I cannot tell you how shocked I was when I read about it. Because as a criminal lawyer, my original uh, focus area or specialization was in criminal law. As a criminal lawyer and particularly a defense lawyer, I was shocked that somebody will actually upload proof of his own crime online. Why would you share your own crime online? How can you believe that you are so inured from uh, uh, prosecution that you think you can dare to share this online? And this is why I have been emphasizing again and again the importance and need for effective enforcement for the stories of powerful enforcement, enforcement going out into public domain so that the criminals will know that they cannot be so bold as to upload proof of their own offenses online. So this is where we come from. And my whole take of the suggestion of artificial intelligence as a filtration tool was twofold. One, as I already said, once content is out there, it doesn't matter whether it's 36 hours or 24 hours, it's out there. So the victims suffer more. Every time somebody else accesses this content, then that person is violated again. So when I was doing my research and I have given the links also in my book, where I've talked about how I went to, and this was on YouTube, something all of us go to, right? So you also have to be really careful because the problem with artificial intelligence is it doesn't, it can be pretty stupid at times, you know, because it doesn't distinguish. It doesn't know whether the, who has accessed this uh, uh, computer resource at what time. But even if you have accessed only very innocuous things, for instance, one of my friends told me that they watch a lot of uh, Malayalam movies. 
it's not like all malayal and south malayalam movies are some of the finest you know with delves deep into various social issues etc and yet for some reason ai has been built because ai carries the bias of the creator so the creator's bias probably with respect to malayalam movies has been carried forward and she landed up with suggestions for pornographic content the worrisome part of it for her was i request people to please not write on the slides please do not uh, you know do actions on the screen because it can be distracting for others also so the problem with ai and how it works is if the creator had this bias that malayalam movies somehow have a lot of um, soft pornographic content stop or, the annotation in the screen sharing itself nobody could uh, would be able to write it i'm sorry and you can stop the annotation on the screen sharing automatically nobody can scribble on the screen yeah that's okay because i don't want to take up more time on that i'll have to look for it so anyway just to continue with what i was saying so the ai picks up the bias of the creator so when uh, we um, we are talking about this bias and therefore it could have led to pornographic content the problem also is imagine if your child is online and your child does not know the difference and if you think this is again just a general threat i can tell you from personal experience that there i have come across instances where you know a lot of children play online multiplayer games again here is a red flag for all of you mmorgs so what mmorgs stands for is multiplayer games which are role playing games so for instance you go on to the sites you will create online avatars and you are actually interacting with complete strangers and here is also a red flag for all the parents who may be here on this session you may believe that being a helicopter parent is the best way to protect your child when they are online or on digital domains it she just logging in uh, there was some technical issue just bear with us the meanwhile the questions can be posted because the speaker has consented to answer them she joined she has joined yes welcome, welcome back sorry i i keep giving at least three seminars or more in a week and this never happens but today is one of those odd days when i had a thing so i was just talking about and i'll also go back to a screen share shortly um i was talking about how I'm sorry let me just do the screen share first then yes so i was talking about uh, prajwala and its impact and let me just move forward to what happened in prajwala and this is what i call literally the prajwala effect and we had to primarily uh, you know artificial intelligence at that point of time the suggestion was considered i think ahead of its time probably because a lot of uh, opposition came primarily in the light of free speech now when you talk about ai and if you're just talking about filtration i agree also that it can result in the violation of free speech constructs 
But then we had a lot of issues during COVID of fake news. That has been one of the biggest pandemics actually along with the COVID pandemic of fake news. The infodemic as the Hu Chi uh, called it, etc. The Supreme Court in Alaka Srivastava's case also relied on the same issue. Now, when we had to deal with fake news and hate speech, again, the same concept of AI was what was deployed to see how it could combat this problem. So today, when we move from 2017, when I made the suggestion to 2020, the world is better equipped to deal with this as a suggestion. But what happened in Prajwala was, it uh, Again, perchance she had lost the connection, but she's now logging through the mobile. <clears throat> As she said that there are sometimes issues which arise because of the different scenarios. She's just joining. But meanwhile, as we said that you can post your questions, we have requested to her that she will be taking the questions. Pandya, what has been your experience? I said till the till ma'am joins back, I saw that you had logged in. Actually, I am entirely new to this uh, field. This is cyber crime, and that uh, interested me. That's why I decided to join this uh, session because uh, being uh, in profession of law, we should be always a student. So I thought okay. let me understand the cyber crime and other facets of cyber crime. So that's why I have joined. No, no, that's what ma'am told us, that we all are students of law and they, uh, the young lawyers are uh, young students of law and the other lawyers are born under this era. So they know much better. I'll just, you know, I'll just check as to where she's there. Yes. She's there. Okay, right. uh, over to you, ma'am. Yeah, uh, unmute. And we are just unmuting you. Yes. Well, thank you. I have been on for uh, five minutes now, but you had muted me, so I could not speak. That's all. Oh, it's okay. No problem. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Ma'am, you will have to log in probably from the other side because it again shows the network, uh, network bandwidth. Is you know, yeah, bandwidth issue. I think I'm using it a lot, <laughs> probably. So, uh, I have now connected, in fact, on 4G, and I hope this will work um, better. And um, unfortunately, because of this, I will not be able to share my um, uh, presentation. But instead, my request is if all of you can start sharing your queries online 
on the chat box, then I can also start addressing them. Now, to quickly move forward, what Prajwala did was it changed one, uh, the uh, website was set up by the Ministry of Home Affairs called cybercrime.gov.in. So I told you I will give you the easy way of uh, filing a criminal complaint when it comes to cyber crimes to use cybercrime.gov.in, cybercrime very easy to remember. And in this, when it is an offense against women and children, then you can also give the complaint anonymously. But for all other kinds of cyber crime, you have to provide full details. Now, this is something that came straight out of Prajwala. Apart from this, were consensus proposals which were converted to an order for social media platforms to create specific report buttons to change their architecture to make reporting easier. Very importantly, to in terms of you know procedures for takedowns of this kind of content and to block onward and backward. Am I audible? No, you're not audible, sir. Your uh, mic is on mute. Mr. Chatrat, your mic is on mute. Um, I think that you try with the uh, normal uh, landline itself because the bandwidth of your iPhone is too low. Because I've also been using 4G, that doesn't work. Uh, you can keep two things as a one as a backup plan. I'll do that. And what I've done is I've also then disconnected. Uh, video so that the audio can be, is the audio I'm, better? I, I'm saying what you can do is you can log in through the normal on the laptop plus the iPhone. And iPhone you can do, uh, iPhone will not work with that way, but you can uh, try with that. Because the bandwidth of the iPhone is showing to be quite low. And that is yep. why the picture is also flipping. Today is a day where I'm being tested on this technology use, you know, because I've been very lucky with the use of this over many uh, months now, but I think today is one of those unfortunate days of bad okay. bandwidth. I am connecting from the uh, computer also, and I'll keep this on, on audio, so that one way or the other, hopefully you yes, will sir. be able to hear. But it doesn't that. matter. They say that when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, and we know that you're tough. <laughs> Absolutely, but I really wish that uh, technology no, no, will are, also- We are all actually enjoying the way you are putting across the things, and the way the messages are coming on the chat box itself shows that the intent what <laughs> you wanted is So, um, I have joined again from the computer. Ma'am, you will have to keep the phone slightly distant because otherwise, two uh, uh, You can log in from the mobile, but keep a mobile at a distance. Otherwise, the voice will continue to echo. Yes, You'll have to unmute me, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. Perfect. So, I'm going to try. I'm going to give this a shot now. If it doesn't work, then we will see about the... No, oh, it will continue. Try, try again till you succeed. But we are already successful. Thank you so much, sir. So we are, because the phone is otherwise interfering with the audio yeah. here. So to move forward, uh, Prachwala actually taught me a big lesson, which is that if the codes intervene, and if we do it in a cooperative manner, we can actually find so many remedies rather than even adversarial, but in terms of cyber crime, invariably we are going to be faced predominantly with adversarial processes. So we have to be prepared in terms of adversarial processes also, but what advantage I got with Prajwala was an understanding of consensual processes getting a lot of remedies. So a lot of subsequent cases that have come from high courts, including one of the scariest cases that I have come across, which is uh, uh, colloquially referred to as the, um, um, the um, uh, colloquially referred to as the Polachi sexual assault case. Sorry, I'm also trying to get the screen share back on track. Uh, so the Polachi sexual assault case 
dealt with some of the issues that I had pointed out earlier also in terms of how this um, domain can be misused so easily. So in the Palachi case, what happened was the, um, uh, there was a racket that was going on. So one young girl thought she was stepping out with her boyfriend and unfortunately after she gets into, and this is all in broad daylight, she meets him at the marketplace and then she goes, goes out with him in his car and then she sees that there are four more boys in the car and unfortunately she's molested and she's subjected to violation and all of it is videographed. And then she goes and she's a brave heart who goes and complains to her brother. Her brother confronts her boyfriend and seizes his mobile thinking he will just delete this content and save this sister's honor. But look at what kind of a brave heart they were. When he took the phone is when he realized that it was not a single incident, it was a racket. So nearly 50 victims were unearthed even in the first instance. And here is the scary part. It comprised young girls as well as teachers. And what these people's modus was is either through force or consensually, people were getting into relationships and these were being recorded and then used to blackmail the victims for more, the more sexual favors or for monetary gains. And with 50 plus victims, and that's why it's called a racket and a scandal, what the uh, case uh, disclosed also was that we may have a lot of cases coming out of the Supreme Court. We may have a lot of guidelines because way before the Palachi case, the orders in Prajwala had been passed. Apart from Prajwala, a division bench of the Supreme Court in Nipun Saxena's case had also set out very explicitly what is the manner in which you will deal with content pertaining to offenses against women and children. And guidelines, extensive guidelines were laid down. And yet, in the Polachi case, what happened was there was a leak from probably the investigation side. And a lot of these videos were actually doing the rounds on WhatsApp. And unfortunately, a lot of people thought that they were actually being sympathetic in watching these videos and trying to say, oh, we should do something about it, etc. Little realizing that even sharing of that video was an offense. And because a lot of these young girls were minors. So it's also an offense under 67B as well as Coxo. So not realizing this and this is, and these were all turning viral. It was what I call voyeuristic sympathy over there, right? So a PIL was filed before the Madurai bench of the Madras High Court. And it took up the case to give directions to the government for protecting the identity of the victims and to also block these kind of content being shared through WhatsApp, etc. <clears throat> now, a lot of the directions from Prajwala, if they had been applied in this case, it would have automatically worked because a lot of these issues and where I got cut was actually this aspect which I was saying, one of the phenomenal things that came out of the Prajwala case was that we agreed, the, the social media sites agreed that they will create a hash value of these kind of identified content and will ensure that even future uploads of this kind of content will be blocked. And they also agreed to undertake research for blocking even at the stage of upload. The issue that I had uh, captured in terms of protecting free speech was that I said that you can, instead of us talking about blocking, instead of it just being filtration, what we could do is of unblocking, meaning like a creator, and today in COVID times, we are all very familiar, right? So you could create a kind of quarantine room for content which artificial intelligence identifies. And then once, Human intervention has time. Take your time, 26 hours, 36 hours, week, doesn't matter. Because if some content like this is delayed by 26 hours, no harm. But if it is uploaded and then you take down after many days or weeks, then it causes harm. So my whole submission was that you quarantine and then you have a look at it. And if it is a news item, if it is a movie, if it is innocuous content, then upload it but don't have it uploaded immediately. But this is not yet in place. They agreed to evaluate research on this and that's where we stand. 
and also on what is called as arachnid technology which can check backwards on identified content having been uploaded earlier by somebody else to take it down now today 3 years down the line we have now a lot more technology which helps us you've seen all the things that happen with uh, whatsapp one of the things that it introduced of restricting it to five or four words and now if you notice if something becomes viral whatsapp does not allow you to forward more than once now all these are evolutions or developments that have happened post prajwala where they also are being a lot more conscious the slides which i skipped are very important so i'm just going to quickly go back to this before i move forward because it's very very important in terms of intermediary liability when we talk about take downs when we talk about blocking i'm sure a lot of you may have questions about take downs and blocking and what not now when we talk about all of this what is the implication it is that intermediaries are expected to uh, exercise these responsibilities for the benefit of the exemption that the law has given to them the us gave the tagline to this exemption as safe harbor now when safe harbor provisions are were introduced in india under section 79 of the it act it was a lot uh, less um, stringent than in the us it only it put the owners on the intermediary to say if you prove you had nothing to do with the dissemination of content like this then you will not be held liable now after you know how one case can change the law right it's very intriguing so after the avnish bajaj case or the delhi mms uh, clip case where a delhi mms clip was offered for uh, sale on bazi.com and therefore the ceo of the site was uh, arrested and uh, he faced prosecution etc that case in fact has also given one of the most landmark judgments of, which has become very important in terms of cyber crime enforcement of uh, uh, anita hada and um, uh, sharad digumarthi case i'll come to those also so now what the difference is is this so today we have say a new section 79 where a complete exemption and safe harbor is provided to the intermediaries but it puts down certain conditions now intermediaries are required to comply with the intermediary guidelines that have been framed under section 79 which entails that they will put out notices and they will take down so the reason i kept repeating 36 hour take down is that upon certain criminal content being identified then with notice being issued to the intermediary then they have to take it down within 36 hours unfortunately shreya singhal again passed another order which has very uh, deep uh, connotations apart from striking down 66a shreya singhal also struck down one part of rule 34 of section the rules framed under section 79 what it said was earlier that upon any information about criminal content so even a user could send notice to the intermediary and they would have to take down the content within 36 hours so that was modified in shreya singhal where the court said that this may impact free speech and therefore only when a notice goes from a government authority or a court then the intermediaries have to act on it that doesn't mean that users cannot write to them that doesn't mean that the intermediary will not act if users write to them it only means that they won't be held criminally liable if, even if they don't act so users who have a problem can definitely write to them and then they can take action now this action which is taken under the rules under section 79 is what is called as a take down what is done as blocking or decrypting monitoring etc are rights which are under 69 of the it act so original 2000 act had only 69 and presently it has two additional provisions 69 69 a and 69 b 69 dealt with monitoring and decrypting of data online 
69A, as you all will know with the Chinese ban, uh, Chinese app ban that has happened presently, 69A is for blocking of online content and 69B is for monitoring traffic data. Now, very quickly, because I know that this must be an issue that would intrigue, intrigue many of you, 69A cannot be used for blocking any intermediate, any uh, internet connectivity or apps also indefinitely. It is meant to be a measure to protect. It cannot become protectionism. So today, with the, the uh, ministry opting for 69A as an option for blocking Chinese apps is going to be a very temporary method. I would also suggest that you read this case law of um, uh, Anuradha Basin versus Union of India, and that pertained to the lockdown of the internet that happened in Kashmir immediately before the uh, amendments were brought in, the constitutional amendments were brought in to make uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, union territories and to bring them into the fold in terms of India, etc. So now what happened with Anuradha Basin was, apart from 69A, there is also a uh, rules that have been framed, which the Supreme Court refers to as suspension rules, which the framework itself says is temporary suspension rules under the Telegraph Act. So under that is where the internet blocking happened. Now, the reason I'm mentioning all of these are, you are also, again, COVID has made us all very aware of many things. One provision which has been most used during COVID, Section 144, our curfew provision under criminal law, right? Section 144 CRPC. Now, earlier, before 69A and even after that, what was being availed? Because 69A has a lot of checks and balances. You have to sir, put a reasoned order for a blocking. You have to get, have it reviewed by the review committee. The competent authority also can review and reverse it. And therefore, there are lots of checks and balances, which is why, again, in Shreya Single, when this provision was evaluated, the court felt that it was valid and it can be continued. Now, the problem that happened was since all these checks and balances were there and the temporary suspension rules were much more um, easier to follow, a lot of internet blockages have been happening using uh, the temporary rules instead of 69A. Now, when we talk about temporary suspensions and internet lockdowns, one India has looked at as that which has the maximum number of these, which is not a good place to be. And it is also being used as a knee-jerk reaction. So in uh, Anuradha Basin's case, the Supreme Court reviewed it and said that the very provision says temporary, therefore don't use it as permanent. But it stopped short there. It refused to go into this issue of the use of Section 144 CRPC or of uh, uh, thing or of the temporary rules permanently and circumventing the checks and balances under 69A. That was on an aside. The whole thing comes down to actually two things. The safe harbor provisions which come from the US are under their Communications Decency Act where the US law relies on the unfettered free speech provision under the US Act, the US Constitution as opposed to a layered free speech provision we have under Article 19.1a. As you all know, Article 19.2 still proscribes what can or cannot be done to restrict Article 19.1a and free speech and expression. So when we talk about safe harbor provisions and 79, the way law has evolved in India and what is required of intermediaries therefore substantially changes from what is expected of them in other countries. So when we started and asked for certain kind of protections in 2017, it did seem very difficult or it seemed like something beyond the call of duty at that point of time. Today, we have laws that have come up from other jurisdictions, what I put here, the Australian law, which clearly addresses exactly the same issues we did in Prajwala. And therefore, you realize that with the law's evolution, we are also dealing with a lot more new situations which will come up for social media also. And intermediary laws and guidelines are bound to change going forward. 
Now, one positive story I wanted to share before I moved on to some financial crimes, etc. Uh, because please give me a heads up if I have overshot my time. Because once I start talking about this topic, I really lose track of time. So, um, Operation Blackface was a direct outcome of the Prajwala case, where 400 plus uh, cases, you know, this is why it says 133, but now when I checked uh, uh, with a colleague in the uh, Maharashtra Cyber Police, I was told that 400 plus cases have been actually registered, uh, pursuant to this MOU, which was signed with this organization called MECMEC in the US, and that has resulted in exposing so many pedophiles in India. So this is how it... If... I will just say one thing, uh, because uh, invariably we will go for one or 30 minutes. We have got oh. questions. Uh, one thing can be that we can continue and we, we can take the questions. Another is that we can have a, what we say like movies, a sequel, that we can continue the, in the other part. Otherwise, the questions will be left part. No, I leave it totally to you, whatever you all want. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm there. Yeah. I, at least I am enjoying. I can ask, I can ask the... Uh, because we have muted everyone, they can uh, post it on the chat. How do they want to go about it? Sure. So that now I'm... we have uh, <laughs> Professor Vinay Kapoor. It's her brainchild that, that we should take the student. She knows what is the pulse of the students. Absolutely. I'm just unmuting uh, Professor Vinay Kapoor and yes, we can please. take her call. Because ultimately, it's her baby. Unmute. I'll just check it out. Uh, Ma'am, you will have to unmute yourself, uh, Professor Vinay Kapoor. Uh, Ma'am, what is your call? Since, okay, so uh, what I will do is I will try and cover some of the other aspects I wanted to in the next 15 minutes and then I will, uh, we can take a few questions and then we will close. And if you so there is a lot oh, more we can cover, then I'm happy to come for the sequel, as you so said. That, that's what I'm saying. We had, uh, I will just share with you, we had huh. one session with Justice uh, V. Ram Kumar. And it was going very well. We, it had, uh, we already touched two and a half hours. But then she said, I can teach for five, five hours. And that <laughs> session was fascinating. So I requested him to have a sequel. That was a equally well received. So then I will, have, have, uh, I will pause uh, no, and we have, have a we sequel. Have Professor Vinay Kapoor, I, as I said, we are just the linking points between her. Uh, sure. Ma'am, what is your call? I have nothing special to say about anything because... Uh, no, uh, should she continue or... Uh, ma'am, Napina, uh, uh, ma'am, I think that we can complete by 15, then we have questions that will also take another half an hour. So that should be around uh, 315. Uh, no, it will touch, in fact, touch till 330. We can have a second session thereafter because the way the people are liking it, people are wanting that there should be a second session. And that only speaks, as we usually say on this platform, sequels are only of those movies. Like we have Mr. Singh on our platform. He's the senior advocate plus uh, former president of Gujarat Bar. We say that former anybody having a sequel on that same topic or coming again on the platform shows that the audience are just lat latching upon it. So we will have a sequel <laughs> rather than that. You can complete in 15 minutes and we, we can continue with another topic. Done. So I'm not going to go back to my. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Huh. So uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just move the presentation forward to just share three slides because I just wanted to give a bird's eye view of what are the laws and sections before I uh, moved on uh, in this aspect. So let me do a quick screen share, please. And um, yes. So now uh, I had promised you all that we are just not going to talk only about the problems. Let's also focus on the remedies here. So what I've done is I've just culled out here in terms of what is the law and how it deals with it. So you have here the uh, first is section 65, which is tampering with source code. Now, when we go to 66, you will see already that overlap, which I talked about. Very strangely, in 2000, when they should have made offenses like hacking, etc., an offense, they made it a civil provision. So today, however, you have specific provisions for data theft, hacking, 
And uh, as I told you, the parameters of one, it is without the consent of the owner or the administrator and two, with dishonest and fraudulent intent. So uh, when we move forward to the two new sections, which I have highlighted here, 66R is the old 66, which was uh, transposed here. And 66R or 43J rather, uh, 66I is uh, the old one and 43J is the new one, which is actually a uh, convoluted uh, reproduction of section 65. So again, just very, very quick bird's eye view. And a few pointers here. Cyberbullying can be an offense under the IT Act, depending on what is the kind of bullying that is being done. Many times it involves sharing of obscene content online and therefore it would fall squarely within 67. Many times it also threatens and sometimes does expose personal data. So it could be morphed pictures, it could be uh, real pictures of people which are being shared as extortion, extortion, call it what you will. Each of these are also offenses under 66E and 67 also. But remember, these are not the only provisions. You can invoke IPC also. And those provisions of uh, 354, 354A for sexual assault, 354C for voyeurism, all of these are equally applicable when it comes to digital domains. And that's why I told you that there are enough and more remedies. What is lacking is actually us not taking recourse to those remedies and therefore that's what we should really work towards. So this is just the bird's eye view of what I have just culled out in terms of all the provisions. You also have uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction under uh, the IT Act. So what se section 75 says is, ir irrespective of where the offense is committed, if it impacts a computer or computer resource in India, then India has jurisdiction to entertain and try the case. If you read my book and the topic I have covered there as a separate chapter on jurisdiction, in fact, that was the first of its kind of exposition on jurisdiction, you'll find where I have talked about the issues and concerns with this extraterritorial jurisdiction. IPC was also amended section four to encompass digital domains, etc. The problem was CRPC was not amended and therefore we have a issue over here in terms of this overlap and particularly because 75 applies only to the offenses under the IT Act. So you can still take recourse under four of uh, for IPC offenses, but that IPC offenses will then become subject to the restrictions in terms of 179 and 188 in CRPC. So all these are issues which are very elaborately dealt with in the book. But briefly, again, as I keep repeating oft, you have the weapon in your hand. You just have to figure out how to wield it, right? And finally, you have intermediary liability and saying intermediary liability may be a bit of a misnomer because it's actually an exemption. The reason I've used the word intermediary liability is because an exemption or a safe harbor gives a wrong impression as if they have no responsibility. Under Indian law, it's actually more a liability rather than a safe harbor because it sets out very explicit uh, rules on what an intermediary has to do for them to get the benefit of the exemption. If they violate even one of them, then they are not going to have this benefit. And that's why you have also a lot of uh, concerns and immediate action now happening when it comes to India. So, 81 is a very com complex uh, issue and I would want to close with this judgment since I had already red flagged it. Sharad Digumarthi case. Now what has happened is you have a judgment that has come from the Bombay High Court relying on Sharad Digumarthi's case where they said that where you have special provisions under the IT Act, you cannot rely on general provisions under IPC. I would say that with the affirmation of the Anwar versus Bashir decision by the Supreme Court recently last week in Arjun Panditrao's case with respect to electronic evidence, that judgment is absolutely correct in what it's saying. But where it goes wrong is it's an interpretation of section 81. 81 merely says that where there is inconsistency, 
the provisions of IT Act will prevail. So what matters is whether there is inconsistency or not. And where if you see, for instance, 66 C, D, et cetera, B particularly, which deals with cheating by impersonation, it is similar to uh, 416 of IPC. If I make a few mistakes here and there on the sections, pardon me, because one, I'm speaking from memory and two, I'm rushing through. I'm assuming predominantly, but I'm correct, that's all. Similarly, 67 on obscenity is very similar to 292 to 294 and all that in IPC. So we have first principles to draw from one and two, there are similarities and these kind of instances where there is a direct uh, special provision of apples to apples, naturally the special provisions will prevail for the digital domain. But when it is offenses like outraging the modesty of a woman, et cetera, and uh, sexual uh, harassment, for instance, et cetera, where there is an offense only under general law, and merely because there is an IT Act, it does not mean that those provisions cannot be invoked. So this is where the Bombay uh, judgment goes wrong. And the connect to the Bombay judgment to, uh, that is of Gagan Sharma versus state, uh, the connect between that and Sharad Digumarthi's case is that in Sharad Digumarthi's case, the way it has been interpreted is that, again, that these special provisions overrule general. But what happened in Sharad Digumarthi's case is slightly different. There, what happened was they struck down 67 and the uh, prosecution under IPC offenses was continued. So the Supreme Court said that once you have struck down 67 and on the same facts, you cannot sustain a prosecution under general IPC provisions. It did not talk about really the overriding, etc. But it does go extensively into intermediary liability and all that. For paucity of time, I am going to stop here. And that's why I gave this bird's eye view. I hope this was of um, uh, relevance to all of you. So this is the last message I would like to leave you all with. One, when we talk about cyber crimes, we are talking about a new field. But first principles prevail as much in this field as it does in general crimes. Second, the best way forward when it comes to cyber crimes even today, given the difficulties we have faced in terms of enforcement, is the four P's which I put out there, prevention and protection definitely are a lot more important than punishments. But I truly hope that everybody would take more strength and courage and confidence in systems because we have indeed been training judges, training police for nearly two decades now. So there is a substantial increase in the way they are equipped to deal with this situation. And unless and until more cases and more people come forward, we will not be able to show law as a deterrent. So therefore, with this message from Cyber Sati, which is stay safe, stay online, be vigilant and do not fear if you fall victim, do not believe you have committed a wrong. Do not believe you're alone in this. There are many others who commit the same mistakes. It's important that you come forward so that others can be protected. So take recourse, take the remedies that law gives to you because there cannot be vigilante justice when it comes to cyber crimes. Thank you all and over to you for Q&A. Thank you, ma'am. The bird eye view, I would say, uh, why they, they, they say there's a distinction between a bird eye view and a human eye view is that they say human eye can look to a particular range and a bird eye, they always say minimum minimal is that it has a three, 3D view and it can cover more areas. It's just like when we, once we go in an aeroplane, we can watch more than what we can watch in a bus, car or a train. So the bird eye view, it's actually uh, in true sense, you have given us the view where the entire perspective like we, uh, once you were uh, not been able to connect, we had asked Mr. Pandya th that you have all joined. He said that I wanted to learn the nitty gritties and once I heard about you, uh, that made me made him more fascinated that there couldn't be a better way to connect. So we'll be subsequently unmuting him because we are taking the questions. This is by... Uh, 
and uh, uh, firstly kindly post the questions again because since the voice was lost a lot of messages have come across that uh, kindly tell her to close the video and this thing all uh, ma'am dinesh uh, rajpuria how to deal with a case if someone records our call uh, to whom we have called and makes it publicly through one whatsapp group etc whether call, call recording is an offense and whether to share the same is a defamation or not well the latter part uh, yes ma'am ha huh. so the latter part of whether it's defamation or not will be contingent on the contents of the call and the purpose and the manner in which it is used but per se recording itself is not an offense and the it act or the cyber crime provisions ipc etc are not really dealing with this particular aspect of it so we'll have to go into the other provisions under telegraph act and what not but per se recording is not an offense per se sharing so many people also share now snapshots of chats so that itself can also sometimes be a, a breach of confidentiality but breach by itself in this manner does not amount to an offense this is by parveen selvraj uh, can social media platform be held vicariously or jointly liable for hosting obscene slash prohibited contents without screening or checking yeah so this is exactly what i was referring to under section 79 as the exemption so a social media platform to begin with is not held liable for this kind of content being uh, hosted on their platform so they don't have to exercise filtration or processes etc however once it's brought to their notice through a government uh, order or a court order and if they continue to host it then they are liable uh this is not a question of knowledge otherwise they want to know and this can help this is by nirin sathia does cyber sathi offer internships or does it offer a voluntary program well cyber sathi is a not for profit uh, initiative of mine so yes of course we welcome interns who can contribute to the cause and um, we will be uh, uh, people will have to write in through the site so you please go to cybersathi.org and there will be a query page and you can submit your request through that or you can also write to us through support at cybersathi.org uh, this is by gurpreet kaur you were talking about multi multiplayer games and how it's a red flag so now multiplayer games as i had mentioned i don't know if that was when i lost my uh, audio or video etc but this was a case of literally an 8 year old who was on a multiplayer game and a pornographic uh, clip popped up so the uh, vulnerabilities or threats that come with uh, this domain is this one you are interacting with strangers two you do not know the age of the stranger you do not know whether you are dealing with a kid or an adult so people can post whatever they want in their profiles and you are actually Uh, playing with them interacting with them there are intra chat boxes so when one instance i don't know if you people recollect the 2015 if i'm not mistaken paris attack after that anonymous which is a vigilante group targeted a lot of these uh, uh, isis sites online for which were being used for uh, uh, propagation as well as for recruiting members so once the Uh, online social media platforms which were more visible were blocked actually these uh, multiplayer game chat boxes were being used for uh, propagation and uh, um, for recruitment so it can actually become a tool for cyber terrorism also so this is how dangerous it can be again we cannot stop people from going and playing on these because it has its own nowadays it's literally an ecosystem people literally live it live their lives out there you have comic cons where people then dress up in their avatars and they want to uh, well, you know it's almost like kind of like a reversal right over there also first you want to change what you are physically and move to some kind of a digital avatar and then you want to transmute your digital avatar into the physical world by dressing up like them etc so you can't stop people from going there but then you can definitely um, want them to be a little careful about who they are interacting with i would say it's definitely a red flag for kids though. for very young kids i would strongly advise them not to play uh, uh, mmorgs but it's again difficult to block 
this is by krishnan as we live in a kind of a global village most of the time we fall in prey of international criminals mostly from africa china etc and they do not sweep small money sometimes the loss is huge is there any international forum or what is the forum to go about it well you have only municipal laws right now in fact the last chapter in my book deals with this the necessity for an international forum so um, some of the slides i had there also talks about all the other uh, enforcement uh, mechanisms so for uh, child pornography and very serious offenses like that the interpol does so play a role in it in terms of enforcement but when it comes to courts and cases and prosecutions municipal law is what is it applied so one of the largest cases which i talked to you all about the 27 uh, countries involved and what not was actually uh, tagged as a cyber warfare against estonia so um, initially and this is a denial of service distributed denial of service attack for those of you who may not know what is a the denial of service attack so you imagine that we are now on a zoom call it can accommodate let's say maybe 100 people or 500 people or 1000 so if somebody decided that they did not want the session to take place they have to ensure that uh, vikas and napanay for instance definitely should not be allowed inside so instead of 1000 people coming they share this link with multiple people so 10000 people try to sign in so this bandwidth cannot stand 10000 people it is meant only for a smaller number so similarly all of your systems also your email ids your website everything has a bandwidth it can only take that much inflow of information or outflow because you decide on how much bandwidth you want based on your regular usage so a denial of service attack is where somebody viciously and consciously spam your system in a way where it is meant to hold 1000 but 10000 people try to come in and block out the genuine 1000 people who are the users or they spam it in such a way it crashes because it can no longer handle this um, uh, flow of information that is or flow of data that's coming to it so that's a denial of service attack distributed denial of service attack is so when we uh, try to target one computer to another computer using of one computer may be enough but even for you to commit this crime you need multiple computer resources when the resource you are targeting is large so in the estonia case banks media houses and government sites were hacked and it was uh, targeted to bring it down to a distributed denial of service attack so then you need a lot more number of computers to uh, create this flow of data into this resource so then you distribute your attack through multiple vectors and that's why it's called as distributed denial of service attack and coming back to the question so we have all these options which are happening um i'm sorry um, uh, because i think i i kind of digress so much that i have actually moved away from the question that you asked no no, no not at all hmm. as as uh, as we are lawyers and there are some students because as a lawyer it's always said that the lawyer writes 100 or 1000 pages and still says where is my brief <laughs> so to to assimilate the brief for any lawyer the students who are participating with us in the national law national law university or for that matter anyone uh, they would have to get assimilated at least to this thing that brief doesn't actually mean brief it will always run into uh, thousands of pages well I got, why, myself, i got myself the tributary of story so i try to patch in as much as possible in terms of information here So but, yes, but so, tributary you would always appreciate tributary is always flowing out of a river which is always full of knowledge. So it can't there cannot be a tributary otherwise it will be a lake and that too art artificially created and artificial lakes invariably dry up and that's the source of knowledge also. Until or unless you are not a perennial source of knowledge, you are bound to be uh, blocked on somewhere. And this is by uh, no names written one plus five t asks. is it possible to have a punishment for the cyber crime especially in cases of trolling etc in a virtual world yes so to uh, this also ties in with what i was mentioning earlier also so one um you don't need a specific law with say cyber trolling or cyber bullying 
depending on the kind of messages that are being used by the trolls, you can rely on general laws to initiate action against them. So there are two different kinds of trolling offenses that we come across generally. One is targeting individuals, which is what I talked about predominantly. But the other is also targeting businesses. So many times we have noticed that a lot of these trolling accounts are actually set up, fake accounts are set up to target businesses. And we realize that it could be something that could have been uh, instigated by a competitor. And those are a little bit more difficult to track because they'll keep jumping from one um, ID to the other. But all of these can be tracked and can be made liable. What you have to look out for if you are a practitioner who is planning to file a complaint is that you have to see where is the dishonest or fraudulent intent. And again, this brings us back to what I started off with. Remember first principles. What would we look for when we had to file a criminal complaint? That holds true even for a cybercrime. So you need to see what is the actual act. What are the kind of statements made for trolling? Where can it be an offense under in general law or specific law? Depending on each of these parameters, then you will put together, as uh, Vikas rightly said, the brief and see where the offense lies and then file your complaint. If you're the victim, similarly, you'll have to look out for this. So this is why I call it the cyber jigsaw, because we have to always keep moving between general laws and special laws. But you can be held liable and you can be tracked. So trolls should not think that they cannot be tracked. Like uh, what we are doing on this uh, chat today, let's assume what you said that five or six or many people invariably decide because in some certain webinars, it's... Uh, we have heard people saying that some eight, ten, we can say hackers intrude into the Zoom call or etc. And that they start posing something very obnoxious or you could say pawn. So what is the way out? Is there any remedy against those procedure or uh, any FIR under the IT Act or how to track those persons? Because as you rightly said, because some people, let's assume I am Vikas Chatrath and I want to spoil the entire show of uh, Napi Nai. I can log in by the name, it's my, it's my call. I can log in as a, uh, even write bombshell na a name. And how do you identify that and how do you uh, proceed against that, such a person like? See, every I leaves a trail. So that's why in my book on electronic evidence, I call it the breadcrumb trail. Because just like Hansel and Gretel's breadcrumb trail, these trails are there, but they may disappear quickly. So you have to be vigilant and you have to take recourse to law immediately. And two, unfortunately, for those of you who may be uh, victims of personal offenses, you the police will always tell you, why did you come to us after having the content deleted? The reason is because the breadcrumb trail in those kind of situations is actually online. So forensics is needed. You need the help of forensic experts when it is online crime. But there are certain things you can do without the help of forensic experts also. For instance, if the offense that, you know, somebody talked about defamation, etc. Let's assume a former employee decides to commit defamation of your company. So what they would do is they may create a fake ID and then start circulating emails which are derogatory about your company to your clients. That person maybe as a former employee may have also taken away some of this proprietary data of client information, then what is your remedy? So you don't have to immediately run to a forensic expert. If you have the email, you can easily read the header. So if you go to your email, you, if you look at the top uh, uh, drop down, you will have all the options for headers, raw text header, full header, etc. Go to the header and read it bottoms up and that will tell you the story of the email. It will tell you where it's come from, who has it come from, which is the IP address that it comes from, etc. And once you have the IP address, you can track the person who has sent it. So it doesn't matter what is the name they've used, they can still be tracked. Similarly, for online also, based on where a particular post emanates from, and from the platform, it can be tracked. 
but the minute you take it down the only person who can track it and it can still be tracked but the only person who will be do it is the will be the service provider which is why police tell you to come to them before all this content is taken down etc but to uh, give you a very simple answer for online issues what uh, because just uh, red flagged those you have to give a police complaint and then the police will then uh, invoke the use of forensics their experts to do the tracking and also because if you have to write to the intermediary if you have to write to a service provider to ask for details of whom a particular uh, line is uh, allocated to etc it is uh, only feasible for police to do this and therefore it's better that you invoke the law and go through the uh, regular channels otherwise if you want to do your homework before you file your police complaint you can engage the help of professionals i go for insights before we take a question because invariably you use the word red flag since there are large number of students of the first year of the nlu i would just uh, ask you for a their benefit what do you mean by the red flag okay i'm just uh, okay. it's a, it's a basic question but i would uh, i would feel sometimes since we were all students sometimes we don't ask a question but we feel that it's so simplistic that one doesn't ask but i feel that some students at the back of the mind so i'm glad I'm, i'm glad that they're doing it so you know if you go to a race track you will see a lot of these red flags actual flags which are red in color which are stuck to the ground what is the purpose of that flag one it demarcates the boundaries and it will tell you where you should you know it marks out the track within which you're supposed to go a red flag is nothing but just a warning signal which tells you something which is important so it's a sign posting and if you're asking me what is sign posting it's just the signs that you see at the corner of your road which will tell you which road you're at and therefore you know the address which address you belong to etc so it kind of guides you in terms of uh, it highlights what is important and to a red flag is also a phrase which can be used to point out to something that is a warning signal so it could be both it can give guidance it can give you a warning Nowadays, the call recording is in real time. Uh, again, same uh, the same question. It says the call recording is an in inbuilt app in a uh, large number of smartphones. What is your view on that? I'm sorry. Uh, nowadays, he says uh, this is by Mihir Purohit. Nowadays, the call uh, call recording is an in inbuilt application in the smartphone. What is your view on that? I mean, like I already said, the recording is not real. Okay. Mirin Sathya, what is your opinion on digital literacy, cyber security awareness, and internet etiquette as a part of the academic curriculum? What is your take on that? Very, very important, and that's precisely why I started Cyber Sathya because literacy and digital literacy are two different things. Today we are talking about digital India, we are talking about digital payments, and we are pushing our populace towards. Uh, in fact, one of the slides which I have is one of my favorite quotes from my book. i i will just paraphrase it here the technology is moving us with you know you know at a very fast pace towards a precipice with no brakes no plans and no uh, safety uh, mechanisms right so here we are speeding along like a fast car and i always use this one picture to explain this quote that of a fast car and i will say that would any of you get into you know i can offer you a ferrari lamborghini name your favorite car i can offer it to you and say that you will drive it but without a brake would you take me up on the offer you would not because without the brake the fastest of cars cannot be uh, speeded on right it's the brake which ensures that protection which allows you to speed so i always tell people that law is actually that break digital literacy is another break so you need digital literacy before you rush in without a plan into digital spaces and i'm hoping that through cyber sathi we are able to provide this platform of at least some literacy 
because there can never be an end to it but we had to we had to start somewhere and that's what we have done with this uh, there is that one question which yes, i want to take before the session runs out because yes, i was scrolling bottoms up i think you're scrolling top down so if i may answer that question before you post the no next no you can do that you can do that so somebody has asked uh, is the administrator of a whatsapp group liable for dissemination of a fake or cruel video etc because this is something that's I the message which uh, uh, invariably everyone wants to know. everybody wants to know. and the smile on uh, the uh, face of the vice chancellor shows that you have actually hit the bull's eye <laughs> so that's why i didn't want this running out of time you, before you, you, i you, you, you can question. you can see the ma'am's glee that's that goes without red flags also yeah so <laughs> here is my answer to it if you look read the law very clearly in terms of who is an intermediary and what is their liability 100% according to me an intermediary i mean an admin of a whatsapp group is not an intermediary therefore you cannot hold them liable as an intermediary in terms of vicarious liability also unfortunately what is happening is because these are all the phrases which are being used very loosely people are just assuming merely because the word administrator is being used somehow there seems to be some assumption even with courts or police that they are liable secondly vicarious liability everybody seems to have forgotten that there is no concept of vicarious liability in general law i am talking about criminal law sorry to make it more precise the concept of vicarious liability in criminal law was through a deemed fiction which is in special laws if you remember the birds eye view i put out under the it act also you have a provision of vicarious liability and that again is of offenses by companies an individual who is an administrator of a whatsapp group is not a company and cannot be covered under 85 that only leaves the intermediary if you look at 2w if i'm not mistaken the definition of intermediary it is very clear in saying that it is somebody who is receiving storing uh, processing etc of data on your behalf an administrator of a whatsapp group is not doing that an administrator of a whatsapp group cannot put up a notice as is mandated under rule 3 or the i r the intermediary rules so there and most importantly an administrator of a whatsapp group cannot delete the content so there is no concept of take down which is an inherent part of 79 and the responsibility that goes with it a legal responsibility so with all these issues around it how do you hold a whatsapp administrator liable it is totally incorrect so today we already have a precedent law also which unfortunately gets missed out the delhi high court but this was in a civil case the delhi high court categorically laid down that a whatsapp administrator is not liable as an intermediary but that was in a civil case we may have to wait for a criminal case precedent to come forward but until such time i hope discretion will prevail in not making them liable if i think i have caused a lot of smiles in all the young participants in this session here is a little again red flag right you may not be liable as an intermediary but you can be held liable for your individual action so when we take the same boys locker room case as an example i am not saying this is the facts of the case if a whatsapp group is created and i'm telling you this because as advisor to maharashtra cyber i was working quite closely on this operation black face so you know it gives me a lot of uh, uh, how do i put it uh, it's soul food for me you know that i am able to contribute for causes like this and this operation black face was one of them so we had to work for a very long time to ensure that it was not just something like in a movie thing you know where you get some information and you can do something overnight you need to do a lot of preparation and planning and particularly from a legal perspective to ensure that the prosecutions will be sustained so one of the things that came up and that's what i'm linking over here is that there are actual whatsapp groups that are formed with the sole intent and purpose of disseminating child sexual abuse content 
So I'm taking a very drastic case on one hand and maybe something a little less drastic of the boys locker room case to make my point, which is if the intent, the dishonest, fraudulent, malicious, malefide, whatever we use in criminal law, if the intent to cause harm is there, manifest in even the formulation of a group, then naturally you can be held liable because you're not being held liable as an intermediary. You're being held liable for your own action. So please don't forget this aspect because everything that we discuss in terms of intermediary, vicarious liability, etc. by the way, they are two different constructs. They're not the same construct. When we talk about all of these, we tend to forget that you are liable for your own action. So if you have facilitated something, knowing fully well this was the purpose of it, and that purpose is a criminal purpose, then you cannot shy away from your liability. And this has nothing to do with intermediary or otherwise. And this is the distinction which I feel police are also missing when they blindly move against administrators of WhatsApp groups instead of individual violators. So this was one thing I definitely wanted to cover. And another aspect, I do not know whether any question has come up on it or not. But again, keeping in view the intent and purpose of this session, if I may take one more minute to address one issue, which I'm sure is top of the mind for particularly all the youngsters because of the Supreme Court's judgment also on the cryptocurrency aspect. One, even before that judgment, it was not illegal and there was no ban in India with respect to cryptocurrencies. But what the RBI circular said merely was banks and payment systems cannot be used for cryptocurrency transactions. That is all it said. So pre and post the IAMAI decision of the Supreme Court, nothing has really changed with respect to the situation with respect to cryptocurrencies in India. However, here is my word of caution on it. When you want to dabble in new things, when you want to experiment or be adventurous, it could be in cryptocurrencies, it could be even with respect to the kind of videos or photographs you take separately or with your partners, etc. Remember in the digital domain, there are a lot of hits and misses. There are a lot of pitfalls, there are a lot of vulnerabilities and definitely a lot of threats. So be cautious about it. Cryptocurrency is something that is ephemeral. I'm not saying it's illegal, it is not. So please read my articles on this. And there's also a four part interview that a Japanese publication did with me, which I think may give you some uh, guidance on that. I've said it is not illegal, but be cautious because tomorrow you may face a ban and there is no liquidity in cryptocurrency. So you enter, I usually joke saying it's like Hotel California. You can enter, but you may not be able to exit, you know? So be very cautious when you're doing all this. All the other aspects which I talked about of getting adventurous about taking photos, videos, etc. Remember the digital footprint is always there. So if you're going to experiment, always take into account the pros and cons that go with it. Exercise logic, exercise caution. If you have been experimental and where there may be a change of circumstance, where for instance, your relationship status may change, apply some caution in terms of ensuring that uh, hygiene is maintained, cyber hygiene is maintained. I call it part of cyber hygiene. You know? So you know that these can be used against you if something is there. I'm not talking about criminal acts. I'm talking about sharing of some personal videos or uh, you know content like that. Make sure those are cleansed because don't no. assume that, you know, don't fall prey to blackmail later. Don't allow for people to uh, extort you. And finally, morph pictures. Today, everybody knows there are deep fakes, there are morphing, there are fake videos, there are fake images, etc. So merely because somebody has created that, don't do what a Vinupriya did down in the South. She unfortunately committed suicide when she was faced with a situation like this. She was a brave heart who actually gave a complaint. The police did not act immediately or fast enough. And when another photograph was uploaded and she thought that people did not uh, believe her when she said it wasn't her photograph, she committed suicide. So don't 
you know, let's not have these kind of scary stories out there. Have faith in the systems. Take recourse to the systems because you have remedies in law. You just have to be patient and you have to allow for the system to do its work. So either we can close with this for the sequel or if you have one last question, sir. Uh, one, Mr. Pan one, Mr. Pandya wanted it. Uh, two, there's one question on the Facebook, which I found it's good. Three, there's a one question on the chat box. So uh, we are taking liberty, like you said, that sometimes you feel uh, that once there is a speaker who can actually give insights, so that... Sure, sir. I'm just sure. reminded of that ad, ye dil mange more. So once you have a speaker, you know that who can actually give the insights in the right perspective. Two questions definitely come across. Uh, this is our experience during all these webinars. Either the speaker has given the full knowledge, then people don't ask questions, or they ask too many questions because they know that the speaker can answer it. So there are only two situations where there, uh, there are a lot of questions or no questions. There's no midway. So your, uh, so many questions coming forth, people feel that yes, there, there could be an insight. One I am taking, uh, first I will ask Mr. Pandya to ask a question. He's a senior advocate and a former president of the Gujarat Bar Association. Uh, over to you, Mr. Pandya. Yes, yes. It was uh, indeed a very wonderful session. I really enjoyed because we are digi uh, digitally challenged people, our generation. So we are not that good in the, uh, this uh, cyber crime and all those things. But uh, fortunately, I had an occasion to challenge the internet ban in Gujarat and even PUBG ban by taking recourse of Section 144 of CRPC. And our basic contention was that the procedure of Information and Technology Act was not followed and other aspects of constitutional importance that freedom of speech and expression was being taken away. But uh, somehow uh, we did not succeed. So my just I just wanted to know so your view on this. Gaurav Vyas case? Gaurav Vyas case, I appeared, yes. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I always rely on that when I talk about why you cannot use 144 in situations like that. And I was really hoping that in Anuradha Basin's case, the Supreme Court would address it. Unfortunately, it didn't. It's a privilege to meet you like this, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, this is by Pr Praveen Selvraj. Ma'am, could you address this question? Oh, Police is arresting. Pandya has not completed his question. Sorry. No, I, question, I just wanted to know your view on this. What, what is the possibility? of uh, upholding this argument that our say is that section 144 is not meant for this internet ban and PUBG ban, even PUBG ban we challenge, but the PIL was dismissed at the threshold. And or before that uh, notification was withdrawn. See, there are so many legal ways if they want to ban, if they want to block, there is a legal way available. Why all these shortcuts? According to me, 144 was a shortcut which was bound to fail. And I really hoped Anuradha Basin would have answered that. In fact, I've also written an article on this, I think, which is on Cyber Safi, where I've said that it could have gone the last mile also in completing that. Unfortunately, they stopped short. So, yes, uh, we don't in, have... In fact, our arguments have not, not noted in the judgment. We, we elaborately yes. argued for about one hour in Gujarat High Court. But somehow all the arguments were not noted and they were not uh, dealt with. So perfunctorily it was dismissed without uh, debating much aspects on the freedom of speech and expression and other aspects. So this is what my opinion is or my take on this. We cannot shy away from something merely because it's new and we are scared. So if you look at all these bans and all these blockages, predominantly what are we doing? Just like the lockdown in India, I'm not saying the lockdown was not necessary. Of course, I'm here, hail and hearty, uh, being able to talk to you all without uh, being affected by COVID, thanks to the lockdown, maybe. But what we are doing is, because we are scared of something new, we seem to be saying off with its head, right? That cannot be an answer to every problem. We have to evaluate and have a more balanced view when going forward. If India should not have this uh, negative tag of being the internet blocking capital, of being not too, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, freedom of speech friendly, etc., which is actually a wrong message. It is an incorrect image of India because as one of the largest, as the largest democracy, sorry, uh, we have a lot more rights than most other countries do. 
and we exercise it very confidently, freely, including being able to criticize the Supreme Court, the government, everything on sessions like this, right? So it's a wrong image that India has uh, gained across the world. And I really hope that the uh, authorities and courts will not just jump to everything as if a ban or blockages are the first response. It should be the last response. There are so many legal ways in which you can really protect without it becoming protectionism. When you talk about bans, what you're really doing is protectionism. You know, this is, again, before a, a, a youngster out there asks me the question, watch this movie called AI or artificial intelligence to know the difference between protection and protectionism. You will love it also. You will enjoy the movie also. Oh, the see, the judges are of our age, so they are also not that technically aware of the nice well, of technological. So they are afraid of doing venturing into this aspect and therefore they uphold the policy decision, whatever may be. So because if they go into it, they would be exposed to many other aspects which they are not keen to go into it. I can only say this, that I'm also of your age. But I think I right. had, uh, yeah, probably around that. Very <laughs> old, believe me. 30 years in practice doesn't make you very young, does it? That's right. That's but right. I'm very young at age. That's why I can talk about gaming, animation, MMORGS. Like, name it, I can tell you about it. Right. I can talk about cryptocurrencies, etc. And I can do this from the perspective of the youngster, not just from our age uh, uh, group. You know, no, so fortunately, it has engendered interest in me also. Today's lecture has created a great interest in me. So I will also now examine please, other aspects of technology. Please. That was the whole idea. In fact, when I wrote the book on uh, cyber laws, technology laws, decode, I called it my uh, initiative for democratizing cyber. I wanted more and more practitioners to come into this field. And that's why I actually wrote the book. Another initiative which will be starting next year for those of you youngsters who may be interested is there is something called a Daksha Fellowship, which also I'm part of, which is for practitioners. It's not for students. It's for practitioners who may want to hone their skills further. And one of the topics we are focusing on there is technology and policy. So before we run out of more time, because over to you for the last two questions, I'm going to wait and I'm going to request you to give me both questions and I will take both together. I can understand. Like in the cricket, they say the, who is the best textorious player. They say who can, uh, he's a right hand batsman, but he can hit on the left side also. And that fluent six, what he could have hit on the right side. This is by uh, Praveen Selvraj. Ma'am, could you please address the question? Police has been arresting comedians and uh, artists. How court differentiates the content from the artistic or humor work? Example, uh, uh, artist sculpting a naked woman or a comedian uses F word for humor purpose. What is your take? And, and the second question is, uh, uh, what are the steps to tackle unimaginable disruption of democracy and fake news? For example, creating an opinion on the basis of falsehood elections through social media, etc. What is your take on that? Very, very, very amazing. Thank you so much for these. The first one, comedians, etc. You may want to read my article, which was published in the Times of India, uh, which one of, one of my favorites, okay, I called it the death of satire. It was immediately after one of these uh, comedians was arrested. So again, this is my uh, humble request to all the, uh, you know, police. And in fact, I mention this every time I do their training also, to exercise their power cautiously. So it has to be within the parameters of law and not by elasticating uh, law to meet a requirement, right? You can't protract, you can't push it to a level where it becomes absurd. Having said that, there are always checks and balances. Now, the problem every comedian would face is, for instance, under 67. So I have actually dealt with and come across many cases, for instance, of uh, movie stars and movie production houses, then artists on um, online, uh, uh, like YouTube and all that. Uh, I've not dealt with any of the new age artists on TikTok, but a lot of the artists on other digital platforms, etc. So in all these cases, it's actually just an understanding of law and knowing the do's and don'ts. Whether it's that domain or the other domain, 
what is impermissible in law you cannot do. For instance, there have been many cases that have been registered for obscenity based on the kind of language used or the posters for a movie, for instance, or its content, etc. But there are also these other issues in terms of just uh, parodic or satire being misrepresented as if it is an offense. So we as a democracy have to understand that parody plays a very important role. We should never stop laughing at ourselves. We cannot give away our uh, right to laugh, right? So I hope that uh, these kind of uh, cases that are being registered get struck down faster. Otherwise, we are going to face another Shreya single kind of situation where abuse of law will result in throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? So this is on the comedian's aspect of it. As far as the second question is the last question, I'm sorry, again, I didn't, I realize I have not written it down. Vikas, could I request you to repeat it to me again? Uh, you have dealt with the, uh, the question of the knife. I'll just... In fact, it was on the Facebook. Somehow it is best. Be that as when we are coming on a, a, a next webinar, we will try to connect with that. And uh, at least I can say, and I can also vouch uh, on the WhatsApp privately because the professors, etc., they are saying that we would like to have a, another session. And they are beyond the, like we have a title of Beyond Law CLC, we have participants beyond the National Law School, a, a National Law University that itself shows the people were aware of the fact and God has been kind enough. People know that we bring speakers who have immense knowledge which can be shared. And uh, I would request the Vice Chancellor, Professor Vinay Kapoor Mehra to give insights. Before that, tomorrow we have a session, as, as everyone knows, tomorrow's title is, I'm just telling you, the title has to be correct. Overview of Second Civil Appeal, like in Pan the title is Second Civil Appeal of CPC, as well as Punjab Act. Though we have captioned that as Second Civil Appeal, though in Punjab Haryana we call it as a regular Second Appeal, deliberately we have kept the caption because it would cater to all India participants who can have the insights as to how the Civil Appeal is to be decided upon. We have amongst, we would be having two speakers amongst us tomorrow, Mr. Amar Vivek, who is a former Additional Advocate General Haryana, and Mr. Lokesh Singhal, he's a senior additional advocate general, Haryana. So do join us for tomorrow's webinar. Before I will formally wind up the show, I will ask uh, Professor Vinay Kapoor to give the insights uh, on the basis of which, when as the first brush, we had a discussion, she said that we have to connect with the students. But the way you assimilated the facts, it was a way good connection, not only for the students, but like Mr. Pandya said, and law, what we commonly say, that as a lawyer, you will always be a, law, a student of law. So the only subtle difference, because they say the lawyers only play with words, they say once you are studying, you become a law student. And once you are into the profession, you become student of law. And they say as, as long as you are a student of law, you would continue to reach. And I off speak, and on this platform, just as G.S. Singh, we had come, he said that the only way to reach top is continue to reach uh, stairs one day each day and the moment you stop uh, going on the stairs you would there's only a, one option left you have to climb down and that uh, that's everyone is sure it's not like a sensex which can go down and come back it has to only go, go down and slide down over to you professor vinay kapoor who helped us to connect a session and i would share with you this was our first session when we had took it at 1 pm because you said it was a hectic schedule but i i knew that Saturday, a week weekend is generally, though because of lockdown, the mindsets have totally changed. It's very difficult to connect with the people, but people have actually latched upon and they have continued. Uh, over to you, Professor Vinay Kapoor. And in fact, Beyond Law CLC is also happy to be a knowledge partner with a university of so much repute. That is Dr. B.R. Ambedkar National Law University, Sonipat, and in fact, She's the first vice chancellor, according to my information. Over to you, Professor Vinikapur. Thank you, Mr. Vikas. Uh, it has been a very good experience of listening to Madam Nepinai. 
Uh, she has a command over the subject, and I was wondering that she, uh, without uh, looking over any paper, and she was just keep on uh, speaking, speaking, and she can speak, I think, for ten hours without a break. And uh, I, I was looking at the watch, and it is about two and a half uh, hours, and uh, there's not nothing like a fatigue on the face. <laughs> so really, she is a young lady. Uh, she's with the uh, uh, good practice of 30 years, but uh, I'm wondering with the strength and the vigor she is working for it. And uh, I'm really thankful that she has given a lot of information, not only to the students, but to the teachers and the uh, lawyers, advocates. Because this is the subject is really new subject and we don't want to touch it saying that this is not our uh, field. So we just keep on shunning it. Uh, but that's true what Vikas has said that if we don't grow then we, uh, we stop. Our growth is stopped. So we, ha we have to be student of law uh, even after we have retired. Otherwise, we cannot grow. Every, every day there is something new happening and law has to keep its pace with the new challenges and new things happening around us. So I'm also thankful to Vikas for uh, providing such a knowledgeable speaker to us. So we'll be continuing such sessions in future too. So this was our new uh, first venture, but this was a very good experience. I'm thankful to all other uh, uh, experienced person who has really joined this session, like uh, Mr. Pandya and Justice Kukin. So thank you, everyone. Uh, so thank you, everyone who stayed connected with us. Only on two lighter notes, we will wind up the note. As ma'am said, Napi Nai ma'am is too young. In the lighter way, they say that the girls and women have only th three stages, young, very young, and very, very young. So uh, we have all to figure in where ma'am fit in. And as we all said, after that insightful session, as we, we said, that the only way to move forward is you have to learn knowledge. As they say, the flowing water uh, would always be more clearer than the water which is stagnant, number one. And the flowing water would always cut through the ro rocks but a stagnant water will never do that. So the only way to move forward is to move forward with the knowledge, move, and even during the lockdown, the only way forward is to share the knowledge, as we always say, sharing is caring. So thank you, ma'am, both of the ma'ams. Uh, it was a privilege to be connected with the National Law School, National Law University, and with Nabinai, ma'am. And needless to say, the participants, the students, and people like Justice Kuldeep Singh, Mr. Asim Pandya, that is the force which actually, as we they say, that is the real kick for you that you have to do better and better. Because they say, do from good to better and from better to best. That is the only way and never do the rest. And that's what we say. And as we part, do the part, parting off, we will connect with Napinai ma'am and we, have, we would have another webinar. She was saying we will have it on the electronic latest judgment. But I said that the First and the foremost desire of ma'am is that of cybercrime. But I am, I am sure that it's another mode though we connected through cyber sati. But the sati would continue to venture with us in different spheres of knowledge. We will not restrict to ourselves to the cyber because they say once you are connected with cyber, the only way is that it has to go on and on. It is just uh, a snowball. So stay safe, stay healthy, and do stay connected with us. And Mr. Pandey and Justice Kuldeep Singh need this to add. People like you give us the immense knowledge and they are the main fueling source of the engine to do better for the society. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to